Great, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion about networks. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the evolution of the network as such, or, um, or the spin-off process. What I want to focus on is, uh, is network analysis. So this is joint work with Chris Vanitla, who's here somewhere, perhaps. Uh, and what I want to tell is a story, uh, I want to tell a cautionary tale of network analysis. And the reason that this is a cautionary tale is that there, uh, there is a gap between what quantitative network analysis might tell us about the relationship uh, amongst firms and what the actors involved in that network will tell you when you interview them. Uh, so, in short, if the quantitative analysis of networks is suggestive of a pipeline of networks between actors, what does this tell us about the actual flow of information between those actors? So, what's flowing through the pipeline? Um, so, for this presentation, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, innovation networks in the Irish biotech sector. And uh, biotech industry, of course, is renowned for having an external innovation network business model. And this stems, for the most part, um, in the aftermath of the Human Genome Project in the, in the United States in the 1990s, where just so many uh, new research opportunities arose so quickly that it was difficult for large uh, corporations to exploit all of these opportunities. And smaller, dedicated biotech firms emerged. And these firms, with a sort of collaboration of um, public research offices, university research, so on and so forth, undertook the, this dedicated research. And larger biotech firms came in at a later stage with strategic alliances and license, licensing agreements and so on and so forth. Uh, this business model, of course, isn't the case in every industry. Pharmaceuticals are only moving now, shall we say, from um, a large big pharma internal R&D effort to this more externalized entrepreneurial R&D approach. Um, so just by way of outline then, um, I'll, give, I'll just mention uh, the context and the background of the study. Um, then I'll undertake, or I'll tell you the details, of a short quantitative analysis of this innovation network in the Irish biotech sector. Um, and then I'll contrast the findings of that with some interviews that we took out with, with who were identified as the key actors in this, in this uh, innovation network and just show the daylight between what the quantitative analysis suggested on the one hand about their relationships and when we speak to them, what they actually have to say about the knowledge flow in this innovation network. And then I'll end with some, with some conclusions. Um, so, uh, the paper itself has two aims. Um, one of these aims is, a, is the methodological aim that I've spoken about, this sort of cautionary tale between how far quantitative network analysis can get you and what actually happens on the ground. And the other uh, aim of the paper is more theoretical in terms of the influence of different types of knowledge on the, on the innovation network. That is to say, the difference between technical R&D, this narrower technical knowledge on one hand, and maybe a broader industry, market, and business knowledge on the other hand. So different types of knowledge in this network. And the type of network itself that is to say, maybe the distinction between a formal network of, um, of licensing and strategic alliances on one hand, and an informal network of, of um, uh, co-directors, former employees, university alumni, this, this personal network. So we make distinctions between the type of knowledge in the network and the type of network itself, and we want to see how this impacts um, the extent to which the knowledge flows within this innovation network. Uh, and just to say that this work forms part of an OPALS project, um, which was Open Philosophy for Associated Autopoietic Digital Ecosystems, Autopoietic, so it was self governing, and funded by uh, Framework uh, uh, Program 6. So, what was happening here was that there was a project to see how can we enhance uh, the flows of information between actors in a network, how can we make some kind of digital cloud computing like ecosystem for actors to transfer knowledge better. So that's where all this um, research comes from. Okay, so um, some of this might have been touched on already. Um, uh, research that tries to conceptualize economic development and territorial economic development uh, more in terms of the knowledge flow rather than the cost benefit of companies locating together 
uh, is a very poor ground for network analysis. So in more recent times, if you think about agglomerations or industrial districts or clusters, people emphasize that the benefit of this coming together of firms isn't just the scale economies or the reduced costs, but it's the fact that there's a knowledge spillover and technical ideas get uh, transferred and permeate within this network. And uh, within this setting then, this sort of network analysis that I'm, that I'm going to undertake uh, offers a lot of potential because there's a lot of little conceptual tools and devices for uh, capturing or quantifying or just sort of characterizing um, the network as a whole and the actors in the network. Um, which players are gatekeepers of knowledge, who in the network is isolated, who in the knowledge is a sort of a conduit or link to other people within the same network. So these network tools are, are very timely and very useful um, for this characterization of, say, how industries evolve and develop, how industrial concentrations become stronger and bigger and perpetuate over time. And um, within this dis discussion then, people think about, okay, well, um, Formal networks and informal networks might have different properties. That is to say, the, the personalized networks versus the contractual networks. Um, people also argue um, that, um, for example, for informal networks, maybe uh, informal networks are just when I tell my colleagues or my former colleagues about job openings. Maybe the actual the, the information content isn't so high or strong. On the other hand, though, maybe we have deep technical discussions about, uh, about problems solving and so on and so forth. So maybe valuable technical knowledge does flow through these networks. But some people disagree about the importance of, the, the importance of informal networks. I'll touch upon that as I go on. Uh, so like I say, in this paper, we want to firstly identify the structure of these innovation networks in the Irish biotech industry. And then we want to talk to people in the Irish biotech industry to see, well, are these networks actually being utilized? What's flowing through this pipeline? Of networks. Um, so, by way of methodology, then, as I've mentioned, I'm going to carry out a quick quantitative social network analysis. And we've seen some fantastic graphs in the last presentation. Mine are quite humble in comparison, as you'll see, but they, they're the basic model. They, they, they work. Uh, so, we, we do these, we can make these graphs, and then we can quantify in numbers the structure of the network, and what we do then is we speak to people, we, ca we carry out a set of interviews with the people who, are, who look to be key actors in the Irish biotech industry and ask them about their network experience. Uh, we put together some data sets on the Irish biotech industry. One, of course, is, uh, is our patents, so inventors and companies in the Irish biotech industry. Uh, we use the data from the various patents office. We collect and, and process this data. We also uh, put together a data set on directors and joint directors and co-directorships within the Irish biotech industry. Uh, and we do this by all of official company websites and media outlets and the FAME data set as well, which is a large collection of, of business and financial records for all these companies. Um, just a, a few words about the, the biotech industry. Um, we're speaking here about the modern biotech industry, so it's just post-genetic engineering era biotech. So it's over the last 25 or 30 years. And we're talking about companies that are biotech enabled. And uh, the table that I have on the screen is a few years back. It's from Intertrade Ireland um, uh, publications. And I just want to point out that uh, Irish biotech is, for the most part, concentrated in biopharma and biodiagnostics. So at the time that this table was made, 68% of the companies were in this uh, space. And when this uh, report was carried out, 52 indigenous biotech companies were developed, or sorry, were identified. This is our starting point for our data set. We then add more biotech companies to our data set as we go along, and we have a population of 86 indigenous mm -hmm. firms. It's only the indigenous firms that we look at then in the social network analysis that I'm going to speak of in a moment or two. So we just concentrate on the indigenous ones. Um, I'm an economist. There's a lot of geographers. Here's a map. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for those uninitiated with, with the, the layout of the Irish biotech industry, um, obviously a lot of the companies are concentrated in Dublin. They're mostly bio, biodiagnostics, biopharma, and pharma services. We also have a concentration in Cork, which are mostly biopharma and agri. And also in Galway, which are mostly biodiagnostics. And these, um, 
these fits to some extent with the multinational companies that have concentrated in those areas as well over time. Uh, we could also look at the biotech institutions, sort of public research uh, institutions and universities and where they're located. This is from 2006, so there's even a few more in the meantime, just to give you a general first impression of where everything is located. Um, but for my part, I want to carry on with the social network analysis. Um, I think we're all familiar with the general idea. It's about relationships. The actors aren't independent units, as you get in sort of traditional econometrics, but rather they're, they're, they're related actors. Um, and it's this relationship that warrants this particular type of analysis. So the actors don't act independently. Um, and the knowledge transfers between the actors, and that's the link between these actors. Um, so we can look at the individuals in the network and where they are and what they do, or we can look at the structure of the network as a whole. And that's going to be more of our emphasis as I go on. Um, and a few key concepts then with, um, with networks. How dense is the network as a whole? Are there clusters, separate local clusters within the network? How connected is everybody? Who is central and who isn't? And there are different types of centrality. I'm going to mention between this centrality, which is how many other actors are linked to me or am I the, the conduit to. So I'm standing between other actors, so I'm their gateway. Um, we're going to focus on two particular networks. One, a co-directorship network, and we're going to take this as indicative of an informal interpersonal network. So if I'm the director on two companies, this is, uh, I am a personal link between one company and the other company, and it's a face-to-face -face informal network. Uh, and the second network we're going to look at is a co-patenting network, and we're going to take this as indicative of a more formal inter-organizational network, where there's some contractual agreements between two organizations. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, um, I just start with just an illustration of the network and just point out a few key features. This is our network of co-directorships, of directors and companies. And uh, the larger the the, the square or the circle, the more central the actor is. The blue squares are, um, are the companies in this case, and the red circle are the people. And the key point of this is that there are a certain number of directors, about 10 in this case, that are very central in this network. They're arranged on the outside, like a little chain or archipelago for the genres. Um, so they're on the outside, if you like, and there's about 10 of these key directors that are very important in linking this network, the, the collection on the inside are less important. So there are a number, a set amount of key players that link key companies uh, in terms of this co-directorship network. Whereas when we look at a, so that would be our informal network. And when we look at this formal network of inventors and companies, it's a different type of network with only one, one or a few key companies, and that is Elan and Elan spin-offs. So the large blue square is Elan. And as you may know, Elon ran into some um, accounting uh, <coughs> difficulties in uh, 2002. And since then, Elon had to undertake uh, a process of divestment. So it had to sell off its, a lot of its biotech assets. And 12 spin-offs emerged from Elon alone between 2002 and 2008, a topic that Heike and I were discussing earlier. Uh, so this divestment event unleashed a wave of spin-offs. So Elan and Elan spin-offs are very central in this, um, in this particular network. As for individual researchers, individual researchers don't tend to be linked to a lot of different companies. There are just a handful who are linked to two or three companies in terms of creating patents here. Uh, the green bubbles or circles are uh, researchers who are abroad. A number of Elan researchers are in the United States. Uh, so, these sociograms just give you a kind of initial impression of the type of network we're talking about and how networks tend to look. Um, we want to look at the structure, we want to quantify the structure of networks. And there's a particular structure that we're interested in, and it's called a small world network structure. And we're going to see that this has some interesting properties, and we want to see is this present in the biotech industry? Um, so the small work network phenomenon goes back a number of years. Um, Milgram, in 1967, was undertaking interesting experiments. For example, if there was someone in Dublin that I knew, and I wanted to deliver a letter to them, but I didn't have their address, but I only knew some characteristics about them, maybe their age, their education, their type of job, how would I get the letter to that person? 
how many people would I have to pass the letter to until it got to that person? And he found that invariably only about six links or six passing of the letter were required to get the letter to the right person without knowing their address. Um, so this, uh, you know, and this phrase of degrees of separation comes from this, or it's a small world, you know, like as we all would say every day. So these type of experiments sort of initiated this small world idea. So we found that most actors were connected to a small series of intermediate steps. And the most interesting networks for this kind of uh, analysis are large networks that are quite sparse overall, so lots of actors that aren't connected. They're decentralized, so there isn't one central actor connecting everybody. But within this large sparse network, there are some specific clusters. And this clustering aspect is important because it means that there are some benefits to a small world network. And the benefits are that even though the whole network is sparse, there are some strong pockets or clusters within this network. And then maybe just one or two links between these strong pockets or clusters actually gives the network a very strong shape. It means that everybody is actually closer connected than they originally realized or that they perceived. Uh, uh, so uh, as well as people being closer than they originally perceived, these networks have been shown to be very resilient and stable over time. If you add new actors to the network, even just randomly, the network keeps these clusters and the links between the clusters. So this small network, uh, very resilient, and people are more connected than they realized. We want to see if this is present in the biotech industry, and this would give us the impression that the biotech industry has this innovation network that's very conducive to knowledge flow between the actors. Uh, so uh, the nuts and bolts of the small world then, that I'm going to look for quantitatively is, um, is the network as a whole not very dense? It's sparse. Are there a number of specific clusters within this sparse network? And is it possible to get there from here in a few brief steps? Uh, this translates into a few measures, if you like, of density, the length of paths between people, and a clustering coefficient for the local clusters within the network. So that's what I'm looking for, essentially. Um, so details about the, the Irish uh, biotech directors and the biotech researchers, I won't dwell on it. Uh, I'll just go straight to, uh, to some of these results. I'm not going to go through the numbers. I'm only going to tell you what we find. We do find low density, for, this is the directorship networks. We do find that it's a low density network, this directorship network. We do find that there's strong clusters within this network. And we do find that the path length is relatively small, relative compared to other biotech studies of small worlds and other random networks that can be created. So we have a benchmark to benchmark this, and you have to trust me a little bit. Um, so suffice it to say, we find our small world properties uh, in, this, in, in this setting. When we look at our patents, similarly, we find it's a small world network again in terms of low density, high clusters within the network, and short path lengths. Uh, so what does all this mean? Uh, so what we're seeing is that the biotech networks, informal and formal, have this strong network structure. We also see that um, the clusters are stronger in the informal networks rather than the formal networks. So this suggests that these informal networks of co-directorships and face-to-face -face networks are actually uh, more conducive to some kind of knowledge flow. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's what I said. Uh, these informal networks seem to be the ones that, that are more suggestive of a tighter network of actors. Uh, that's our quantitative result. How does this hold in practice? We interview eight biotech firms that are seen to be the most prominent in our networks, and we, we show them the sociograms, it's a semi-structured interview, and we ask them, do you interact with this part, with this <coughs> other actor that we think you do? Do you interact with the rest of the network as a whole? We try to ascertain if their experience matches what we think we found. So are these networks exploited? Uh, so firstly, I can stick with it. Uh, I should say that when we speak to these to these biotech actors, we want to distinguish between technical knowledge and a broader business and market and uh, innovation process knowledge, and this will come out in our results. 
When we consider the, the patent network, the formal network, what we find there is there's no evidence to speak of, of of this patent network currently functioning as a pipeline for knowledge, that knowledge is actually flowing through this patent link. Uh, what tends to happen is that the companies have engaged in the past in, in brief projects that have created patents, and then these links dissolve, or else these links turn over time into informal links between the individuals. So we don't find that these patents, uh, formal networks, continue as formal networks over prolonged periods of time. They're just project networks and then they dissolve and people choose to keep an informal link if they want. Whereas uh, with a network of directors, there's, there's some but still relatively limited evidence that these informal networks between directors face to face, if you like, that they do act as pipelines for local knowledge flow, but only in certain settings. Firstly, we find that, apart from one case, there's no technical knowledge flowing between the directors, or flowing between two companies through a co-director, because the director is obviously uh, a subject to confidentiality agreements, so it wouldn't be appropriate that there would be such a big exchange of technical knowledge. Um, there is a certain amount of know-who and general business knowledge flowing through this co-directorship arrangement, so know-who pointing people, uh, making introductions, and pointing people towards the appropriate person. Um, but even in the case of know-who knowledge and general business knowledge, this is embodied in the individual directors. So they don't always have to consult a network and go to links in step one and step two and step three. A lot of this network about knowing by person, a lot of this knowledge about knowing by person is just embodied in the director. It's not a network story as such. And this questions how far you can really go with this network explanation of knowledge flow when it's not just a stage of links or paths from actor to actor to actor. So we also find that the directorship network is only one of many informal networks, of course, that exist within these companies, within this industry. And other more, equally or more important networks would be uh, professional networks of individuals, maybe their business associations, previous employment history, networks of university alumni, social networks in some capacity. Um, and this is borne out in, this, in the remarks that fall out of the interview process, where um, people say that, oh, the most important channel of information is between former workers or people who move on or you know, um, some, some previous employment history, if you like. Or um, true former uh, collaborations that may have been formal and technical, but then just dissolve, as I mentioned, into informal social arrangements, and it's still easier to pick up the phone, as the quote has it, and talk to that person, because there has been this work history in the past. We did find that there's a, there a few uh, incidents in, uh, should I say, uh, with respect to local information, it isn't that rare uh, how can I phrase this way? Uh, there aren't that many incidences of intentionally picking up the phone to someone else in the biotech industry to find out local information. Because the, the industry is so small that all this knowledge is familiar passively to all the local actors. So there isn't a local story in the biotech network. It's not that the local individuals call each other up informally looking for introductions. It's a small scene and they all know each other. And it's this long-term participation um, that, that negates against this local working of the network. Where the informal network does, have to have, does seem to have some currency is firstly with less established firms who may be trying to incorporate themselves into this network or trying to establish themselves or aren't as familiar as the long-term participants are with all the major players in the network. Our informal networks seem to have a lot of currency in terms of non-local actors. If I want to find out about non-local actors, then maybe I'm looking to my local network to see who has some non-local international connection. And suddenly the network itself maybe has much more value and currency and a much stronger role to play. Uh, I'm just going to finish with, with some conclusions now. I think I've uh, eaten up all my available time. So, uh, again, this was aimed at being uh, a cautionary tale about network analysis. Okay? And all we find is that quantitative network analysis is suggestive of there being some functioning network. Okay? Uh, it reveals the existence and structure of a network, formal and informal, 
and tells us that the informal networks tend to be uh, more conducive to knowledge flow than the formal networks. Um, but our question is, of course, are these networks being exploited? What's actually flowing through the network? Is there much or anything flowing through the network? Um, and we found, of course, that informal networks of patents don't appear to be currently exploited. It's just that old project-based uh, formal networks um, dissolve and, and become informal connections over time. The informal uh, networks, they do facilitate a certain amount of low-move knowledge and, and industry knowledge, rather than technical knowledge. But for the most part, this is embodied in the directors, and it's only maybe in the non-local setting or new actors coming into the local setting that these knowledge that these knowledge networks really have currency. And what's more more important in formal networks than our co-directorship networks might be professional networks of individuals, uh, alumni networks in universities, and social networks in terms of uh, employment history and the like. Okay, so I'll finish there.